please welcome them all to the stage here. I'm going to pass the mic to you all. Welcome. All right, signs in place. <laughs> well, welcome. Welcome, Vanessa. Welcome, Chad. Welcome, Christine. Um, thank you all for joining this panel. Today, I thought we would follow on, if, if we could, some of the concepts around the transformation that's going on inside of your companies. Each of you um, represent slightly different nuances on the commerce model. So I think we've got a lot of really good things that you can share. Um, what I thought I might start with is clearly there's been an enormous blurring of channels. And that is creating real challenges for people who see themselves as either just online uh, pure plays, whether they're a wholesale retail combination, whether they're participating in marketplaces. What I'd love to hear about is your ecosystem and what it's really like right now working inside of your personal ecosystem. So who wants to start? Christine, will you do it for me? Hi, everybody. Um, so I um, run e-commerce and marketing for Adriana Papel. Uh, we manufacture, wholesale, and ship direct-to-consumer women's dresses. Um, the brand is a 38-year-old brand, but for 38 of those years, we were traditionally a wholesaler. Um, so you buy our dresses primarily through the major department stores. We don't have our own stores in the United States. We do overseas. Um, but about two years ago, we launched our direct-to-consumer business, really because the customer told us that she wanted it. Um, she was calling us. She was checking out our non-commerce-driven website. Um, and actually, um, we've been able to build a very fast-growing um, direct-to-consumer business um, accordingly. But it creates its own challenges, right? So we sell direct through our own website. We also sell through different marketplaces. And my number one competitor is myself, right? So the same dresses that I'm trying to sell to the consumer, so is Macy's, so is Dillard's, so is Nordstrom's. And really um, determining how to best go to market so that ultimately the customer understands the value she's getting is something that we're trying to really work through and optimize across those channels so that it makes good business sense, right? Which channel is more lucrative for the business to sell through, how do you reach a, a target net of people than maybe you would in one channel versus the other, but ultimately, how do you not confuse the customer in the value of shopping one versus the other? So we build a lot of programs so that she understands the convenience of retail, but also the convenience of shopping direct online and having the chance to try it on and return it if it doesn't fit her and so forth. So that's kind of our complex little circle that we have there. That's pretty complex, yeah. especially for some, a company that's 38 years old that has only recently come into commerce. Correct. So you weren't an early adopter company. Right. So Chad, how about at Fossil? Yeah, so um, um, everybody, I'm Chad Corsable, uh, Senior Director of Commerce at uh, Fossil. Uh, for us, it's, um, you know, getting our content out there as we start getting into the um, technology space for, for Fossil. You know, everybody knows Fossil as being a, a great watchmaker, uh, leather handbags product. And, and for us, it's, it's understanding what consumers are buying at Macy's versus Dillard's versus the other pieces and really being able to tell the story of of the connected product. Um, how is electronics going to come into the fashion space of a watch? Um, how can you tell the videos, the stories, and really get that content out there in front of the consumer? And within that is getting the information back from the wholesaler. Um, you know, as you and I were talking about earlier, you know, we're, we're creating, you know, these disciplines that, um, you know, um, we need to go help the wholesalers. We need to help every channel that we're out there and to say, hey, to, to change the, the paradigm that it's not you against us, it's we're together. Because if, if they can rise, then we can rise as a company. And uh, that's one of our biggest challenges that, w that we're facing right now. Um, you know, I am on Amazon, but I also have my own third party uh, mm -hmm. site as well. So um, I'm competing against myself, you know, a, a lot too. But, um, you know, uh, we're doing our best to, to educate the consumer and keep the consumer um, you know, firsthand. All right, Chad, I want to come back to that because I want to hear about some of those conflicts. <laughs> All right, Vanessa, uh, you're, you're in a pure play business. 
Yeah, so uh, the grommet is predominantly e-commerce. That's where we started about nine years ago. Um, a couple years we, uh, a couple years ago, we did actually move into wholesale as well. So, trying to test out that channel, um, not only just dist uh, distributing to boutiques and smaller retailers, but also trying to find opportunities within larger corporate uh, companies such as Ace, Bed Bath and Beyond, and trying to find that um, that exposure there. And one of the challenges um, is really about. Uh, we go out there, we find these entrepreneurs, these makers who have these unique and innovative ideas, and really we're the platform to help showcase them and market them out to a consumer audience. And there are a lot of big players out there who are also trying to identify unique and innovative ideas as well. So we're playing in a game of a lot of uh, big fish, so to speak, um, in this distribution model. One of the things I think is a significant challenge um, as technology continues to advance is not only um, the omni-channel space, or the way in which people are purchasing, um, whether e-commerce or in local retail, but also the device at which they're browsing these products and then ultimately purchasing. So we have about a 50-50 split on our digital channel um, between desktop and mobile device. And so you have to also think not just about how people are browsing, but how they're shopping and how to um, enhance that experience for those consumers um, based on that device, because it's definitely a unique experience. So in listening to the discussion around circles, okay, are there any places where in your organization you work in a circular way, think about circles, or learning to collaborate with others in a more connected manner? Yeah, so uh, being on the product team, so I had product and design, and one of the hats that I've worn, not just at my current company, but at previous companies, is in process improvement. So I find that I work more efficiently when the teams I work with are in better collaboration with each other. So the Agile um, framework that you had mentioned in your presentation is one that I advocate for significantly. And actually, I had just started at the Gromit about five months ago. And uh, there was a new VP of engineering as well there. And it's been great because him and I have had a great alignment in the execution approach of Agile as a framework within um, our teams. And so we've been able to implement the Scrum model specifically. I know there are variations of Agile, um, but we've implemented Scrum. And it's predominantly because we wanted to make sure that we had daily communication. We were understanding what we were committing to as a team. We could rally around it together, and we can work together to actually get those deliverables out there. Um, I think when you... When people look at Agile as that framework, um, I think it is largely associated um, to engineering and technology development. I think that's where it's um, most often uh, associated. So um, that's where I've seen it implemented more specifically, but I think there's a lot of learnings. And as you think about the, that circular model, um, I think there's a lot of learnings that you can apply within the larger organization around how do you get these teams together um, in a cross-functional way so that you can break down those silos and better, better work together. Um, if you imagine people holding onto a string, when you're pulling away from each other, you're not going anywhere. So want to get everyone heading in the right direction. Well, that's a good one. I usually have the challenge of having that discussion around the pyramid versus the circle with a CEO. And because th th those are usually my clients, and they are some of the folks that have the hardest time giving up the pyramid um, and adopting more of a servant leader type model where they're, they actually put their customer in the middle and they don't think they're the, so I can appreciate that. But you, the fact that you're bringing it from engineering and into your work process, that's a good start. Okay, Chet, how, how, about, how about with you? Are there circular models that you're thinking about using or seeing? Yeah, so one of the biggest ones, um, you know, those of you who've ever heard of the fossil case, our CEO actually sits directly in the center of our building on floor number two in a solid glass um, um, office, um, so he, he's always visible. Um, we were pretty, um, pretty, pretty good aligned internally, but, but where we are branching out is to our wholesale partners um, and other pieces, and we're creating internally. Um, a center of excellence is what we're calling it, and it's primarily uh, predominant of digital marketers, uh, e-commerce operations, e-commerce technology, and our data science team. And what our goal is, is we're going to create um, an entire deck uh, to basically educate the entire company first, our wholesale staff secondly, and then to go on to a roadshow to some of our, our major wholesalers to, to 
hopefully to get them to get a little bit more comfortable and embrace what we're actually asking for. We're not asking for internal secret sauce on algorithms of, of how you shift consumers. We're not asking for, you know, um, when are you going to shift and change products? Because I will already know that based on the, the latest tools that are out there when they're changing prices. Um, but it's to get them more comfortable to talk to the, us about the customer journey. Where are you struggling? Um, what do you need to see differently and what we're doing? And, and I'll be the first to, you know, to say I will share any content that we create out on our website. If you look at Macy's.com today, Macy's has 90% of the content that I have on my we own website, and, and that's okay. Um, we need to be in a world where we can coexist and we can, we can um, you know, win together, and that's been a big challenge is to get the wholesale group to understand that it's not us against them, we are there to help, and that's something that, that we are at Fossil um, creating and um, moving forward. Those sound like great best practices. I, I will tell you, we, we've recently been called in to do some of that, what I would call conflict resolution <laughs> uh, circles between wholesale and brands, and uh, it's about educating the partners on the department store side, so, uh, so it sounds like you, you're, you're hitting it right on. Um, how about you, Christine? Sure, I think, you know, um, being that the brand really, the, the majority of the staff and culturally is, is a wholesaler, you, you kind of see your own little e-commerce circle going on and the rest of the company not following the same circle. So you think you can kind of influence them, you can bring well, them into your he, little circle? here's the good news. So <laughs> one of the first thing I did, I joined a year ago after being 20 years at the same company. Um, and I, what I'll tell you is I, I went from office products to dresses and I had to convince the CEO as to why I thought I could sell dresses if I could sell paper. And my answer was, I think I can sell anything if I understand my customer. So the first thing we did was we ran research. And that research has fed a lot of the changes we've made to our site, the way we market. But the thing I'm most proud of is that our spring line for dresses will actually start to influence, it was actually influenced by some of that research. And that's the wholesale side and the manufacturer side listening to the e-commerce side. So the good news is I think that there, there's a sign of hope that they're, they're watching the, the customer-centric approach and how it's helping us be more focused and be a little bit more efficient and able to execute a bit faster. Um, I think it's gonna take a while to transform the whole company. <laughs> um, but um, I, what I'll tell you is our, our direct-to-consumer channels um, at the moment are very much dedicated that way. That's great. I, I found that with um, failures, there sometimes there are even better lessons than with successes, okay? Um, have there been any frustrations along the way as you've been trying to kind of, kind of push toward this more customer-centric, more circular, connected kind of commerce model? What are, what are some things you could share with folks that they, they may want to avoid if they haven't already had that experience? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, some of the, the biggest, um, some of the biggest failures that, that we tripped up on in this is, is getting our technology partners on board with um, being able to make sure that we can access the customer data. You know, um, you know, for so you know the the silo um, slide that you had out there was so true. It, it, you know, um, customer data is the holy grail of a company, but you have to be able to empower the users to go do it. So you know, I was sharing earlier um, um, with Andrea that you know we. We have to be able to have tools as the business owners to go get the data. It's not a technology-driven decision to be able to go say, hey, you're going to go use this, um, this mainframe to go do it. You, you know SQL, right? You love it, right? Uh, no, I don't um, know SQL, and I, and I don't love it. Um, so, oh, we'll open a ticket, and we'll get that to you. That's a problem. In, in modern-day commerce, you know, that creates a wall that when you're trying to do an email pool, if you're trying to do um, site segmentation, if you're trying to do whatever it might be that you're trying to do to, to drive a different experience, that puts a, a block in your way. So what I will say is, is that's been a big challenge um, for us. Uh, one of the things we were able to do is coexist our technology partners within the business. Um, that's something that has stood the test of time at Fossil for, for years and years and years. We finally broke through that this year. Um, and it has gone, um, Tremendously, we're sending uh, less and less email, and our revenues are up um, based on it because we're actually empowering users to get more granular with the data rather than just what they have to type into a ticket to get the pool. 
Um, and, and there's many other examples. Um, so I'd say that that's one that we've been able to, um, that was very, very tough and painful, and, and it probably bled the company millions of dollars, not only from a cost perspective of tools, but also just from the speed uh, to market of being able to um, segment and get to the data uh, quicker. So um, positive we're there, it's taking too long to get there. That's, that's a good one. Now, Vanessa, you talked about fast failing in, a, in more of a scrum and agile model, so there are some failures you probably addressed quickly and moved on. Yeah, one of the things we've actually implemented is uh, testing tools, primarily because we're trying to better understand the changes that we're make, making on the customer side. We want to understand, is this a positive impact to the customer, to the experience, and to the business ultimately, mm -hmm. or is it not really moving the needle much? We're also in a u unique position where we have the opportunity and we have a key initiative of re-platforming. So we're on Magento 1 currently, we're moving to Magento 2. What's really unique about it is the opportunity to re-architect the entire user experience as we're moving forward with this. And it's really important to understand what that, um, what that user experience should be when you are developing this new platform so that you're not putting something out there that you might just have out there right now um, because it exists, but really trying to focus in on what are the pain points of the customer, how do you uh, improve those pain points of the customer, and reduce the, the, the cruff, so to speak, of the experience that might be impacting them. So in addition to uh, the Scrum model, which is focusing on quick iterations, we are also doing those tests as part of the the cadences that we have or the sprints that we have um, within our team um, to evaluate quick changes to that experience. But we're also taking those lessons as we're thinking about this new platform initiative and thinking about the new experience that we want and trying to test out um, if we were to make these changes and go in these directions, is this the right direction to go in? Um, but that's only really the quantitative side. What we wanted to also focus on was the qualitative side. So we've uh, moved forward an initiative, um, and it's just kicking off right now, but working to build uh, advisory boards, both on our B2B side, but also on our B2C side. And its target is really to get a key set of customers who either are happy or not happy, you know, it's good to have that mix, um, who can uh, provide more of that qualitative feedback on the iterations that we have out there, on some of the discovery understandings of, you know, what's their experience out there um, outside of us, and how can we take lessons learned from a more holistic approach to that experience and feed that into making sure that what we're doing is the right thing to do. Christine, have you tried that in your research? You've tried any of the advisory groups with customers? Yeah, so we're actually um, in the process of creating a, a live panel that will um, bring in both existing and new customers. Mm -hmm. um, the fascinating thing about our business is she's anywhere from 18 to 65 plus. Uh, we have a very big bridal business, so we've got some millennials that we're, we're challenged to uh, meet their expectations, and then we have the customer who traditionally, you know, she's the mother of the bride or she's the grandmother of the bride, and she's looking for fit and comfort and style, but she'll only shop at a retail store. So we've got a lot of different customer bases that we're speaking to, but yes, I think creating those, um, those focus groups or doing continual research has definitely been something that's helped us. The, the other thing I'll say is, back to the data point, um, you know, I came from a very big organization that you would think had all their data together, um, but it had a lot of channels, so it didn't. And it was very hard to have a focused conversation um, when we were moving into the world of personalization, um, which we know converts better, but if that data isn't centralized together and usable, um, and it means that somebody like me who doesn't know SQL either, um, can actually action and do something with, then it's, it's really not you know, a, a leverageable tool. So at Adriana Papel, being is in our infancy stage, we're trying to build and centralize that data now, knowing that ultimately, and I think one of the speakers said it this morning, lifetime value is what's gonna differentiate you in this space. Um, so it's about long-term relationships, not just transactions anymore. Um, but that data is so important that if you can't leverage it, it's very hard to, to win in that type of, of view. So outside collaborations becoming much more important. And you know, I would say have completely different sets of challenges than you know, we were hearing from Chad. He's trying to tackle it. Okay, what are you finding is helpful with those outside collaborations to create this more connected commerce? Or is this, kind of, is this the frontier right now? 
I think there's a lot of people that are trying to figure it out, um, to be honest with you right now. I think that um, with, the, with the worlds of Amazon's third parties and um, wholesale accounts and, um, you know, the gray markets, and, you know, there, there's a wealth of different places you can, you can go. Um, is anybody doing it well in your mind at this point? Um, or is everybody question. kind of just um, I think that, bumping into it? Um, I think that folks are kind of walking their way into it, uh, to be honest with you. I think Nike um, made a fantastic move with their, with their deal with, with Amazon um, that they recently did. Um, I think that... Um, that wasn't so popular in some circles. That's sure exactly you know. right. But I think it's the right thing to do. I think that in some cases, a tighter assortment is going to help you um, long term. I don't think that you can do, um, you know, cut the umbilical cord, you know, and just walk away. But I do think that there has to be a balance in, in, in the areas. And I think that, you know, partnering with, you know, external consulting firms, you know, going to conferences and talking to, you know, others that are, that are in the crowd here to, to understand that um, is only going to help us as an industry because it is new. Um, the millennial sector, you talked about it, they, they do shop differently. They want a different experience. So if you are serving to two generations, three generations, how are you gonna balance those three different experiences? Um, and so, you know, I, I loved it earlier, Brendan was talking about sometimes you have to slow down, it's okay to say no. I think this is a moment now, if you are close to par, you do need to slow down. Otherwise you can bleed millions of dollars in technology and R&D um, and development that might be completely wrong. Um, and so I, I know that it's, it's crazy, but uh, sometimes you have to slow down to speed up. And I think that sometimes, I think right now we're, we're living that a little bit in the digital world um, to decide where do we want to go with our next, next channel? What is the right thing for our channel? Um, and, you know, if, if you're global, that brings a whole nother, um, you know, set of challenges, you know, China, India, Malaysia, um, Europe, um, that, you know, an e-commerce site might not be the right thing for you. It might be a hybrid marketing model or um, something else. So I think that it's, it's very, very important right now during the digital age that you figure out what's the right piece for your channel in that locale and in that uh, vertical that you're trying to sell into. It's very interesting to watch what's occurring in the Indian marketplace, particularly because, you know, they have a culture that's actually built on a lot of circles. And they, they leapfrogged, okay, into circular commerce and connecting the dots. Um, I mean, there still are logistics challenges and things of that nature in, in that country, but from a standpoint of conceptually understanding how to get to the ultimate consumer, they just did a major leapfrog. And I think it was because they just were primed culturally. Um, so we gotta recognize how much programming and, and bias that all of us have on how we were raised in business and what we learned in business schools and things of that nature. It, it really, it's just somewhat not applicable to what we're doing today. So, um, so I want to just you know try to circle back to your teams. Okay, how are your how are you managing your teams today? Is it different from when you first came into the business world? Do you do you you know have any different practices than when you first became your first managerial role? <laughs> I have the mic. I'll I'll keep talking. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I I started out thinking I was going to go in the um, um, investment banking route and quickly realized I didn't want to sit behind the desk with a, a suit and tie um, on every day. Um, and that's very much verticals. Um, when I came into um, the e-commerce space, um, I knew that I didn't want to create that. Um, I tried to surround myself with a, a lot of smart but different uh, minded individuals. Um, I, I tried to instill the, the philosophy to, to, to my team that you're going to make mistakes and it's going to be okay. Uh, I try to instill the fact that as long as everybody's on the same page, you're going to be okay and course correct. So I've tried to create a, a sense that you can own a decision as long as everybody's on the same page of where you're going with the decision. So I don't have to be in the room when they're making a decision on a certain piece of a platform where some companies might say, hey, do you, you know, does your VP has the D. Um, we don't abide by that philosophy in my group. Um, now, if it hits a certain level, sure, you're going to get you know some some buy-in. But I want everybody to feel free. Their input is free. Um, before every single project, we have a small little task force. I think somebody mentioned a task force that kind of gets together and say, "Hey, who do we need? Who do we really need at the end of the day? We don't need 50 people in a room. We need 10. So who's our finance partner? Who's this partner? Get in the room and let's set the direct uh, direction. Let's go." Uh, those are the things that I've instilled in my, in my, in my team over the last um, 10 plus years uh, of doing it. Um, so, and it's, it's served pretty well. Vanessa? Um, 
So within product management, uh, one, of the, one of the focuses that tended to be on the way in which you divided, it, specifically a product team, um, and how it interacted with engineers sometimes is based on verticals. I know you were talking about verticals versus this circular um, structure, and one of the challenges I saw with that vertical approach was you might have a product person focused on, for instance, analytics, and a product person focused on thinking about commerce, uh, the checkout flow, and a product person focused on the search experience. And when you do that, you ultimately are creating these divisions or silos where you're not thinking about more of this holistic experience at the end of the day or holistic product. Um, this is thinking more external facing, but it definitely does have an impact internally on how these teams might work together and ultimately the information exchange that could happen. So one of the things that I found to actually be very beneficial and what I've implemented in my teams um, prior to my current role, but also in the current role, the focus that I have is taking more of a holistic approach and thinking more, okay, well, we have a larger platform. Here are the initiatives. Let's, let's talk about how we want to execute against these initiatives and how it feeds into this larger platform so that, so that you are thinking about the, uh, the full entity of that, and you are understanding, well, what are the communication channels that this, uh, ex this customer might have in operationally? Uh, what are the different internal stakeholders that might be affected by this or that we have to coordinate with? So you are thinking about um, all aspects, essentially, of the product and ultimately how that is going to affect internal and external um, stakeholders. So that's really the approach that I've been taking uh, more recently um, and how structuring my team mm -hmm. in relation to that. That, that, makes, that makes a tremendous amount of sense. It, it's interesting, Chad, to your point that, um, you know, when do you get involved in a decision? And a lot of people think that if you use a circular approach that you're going to give up control. You know, I, I tend to think of it more like a ripple effect, okay? One circle that then informs the next circle that then informs the broader circle and, and so on. And so there, there isn't a giving up of, you know, responsibility and accountability. Um, it's just the form in which it takes to share. Um, so that's, that sounds like you or doing that with your teams. And it sounds like the lessons that you've learned from the you know, agile management is really affecting how you're bringing people together. But I'm still surprised when I go into companies and see uh, customer journey maps that are totally linear. And then I wonder how they actually get to customer life value, which is actually a circular piece. Um, so you know, so if, you're, if you've got that linear customer journey map, you might want to go back in and check, check on that one again. Don't you really want the customer to actually become a referral, okay, or become a repeat client, okay, or have a, a future spending pattern? So that's a circular behavior. So Christine, how about if we wrap it up with you, okay? Um, it's a big difference from selling paper to selling dresses in some people's minds, okay? But you've been you've made the leap, okay? What do you hope to bring from your old organization? And what do you want to leave behind? And then what are the things that you think you're going to learn from the experience in the fashion world? So you know, the thing I, um, I've said for years that I've always loved about my job was um, I wake up in the morning, I know what I'm going to do. And at the end of the day, I know if it worked. right? And that's the beauty of e-commerce. right? We have the tools. We have the metrics. Um, and, and a little bit more leeway, too, than I would say the rest of the organization. So one of the things that I definitely brought um, to my new role was that philosophy of if you don't know yourself how you've impacted the business, then you better ask because you don't then have the right tools to do your job. Um, because we should all at the end of the day, and whether it's a day or it's a week or whatever it is, we should have the tools to be able to measure and move on. That idea, that, that idea of fail fast and do it again and fail fast and do it again until you get it right. Um, so I would say that, that definitely I took that with me. Um, and I think, well, it's a culture shock for the organization that I'm in. Um, now, because it was so different, I think in any e-commerce organization, especially with the, the, the younger people now entering the workplace, they need that level of empowerment and that level of um, ability to make decisions that as long as they're measurable and they can move on from them, you know, there's little risk. Um, I mean, the things that, I, that you, know, you leave behind are, you know, the red tape, um, the multi-channel beast that a lot of us have worked in um, and the, um, the many people that sit around a, a square or a rectangular table <laughs> that all have to say, go, 
Um, I think that that's in today's environment, given how fast the pure plays and the startups are moving, that 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 red tape uh, needs to go away. So um, we could probably all say that about organizations we've worked with, we've worked with at one time, and there's always a little bit of that left. But but yeah. Amen to that. Well, on that note, I want to thank our panel. I think they've just been fantastic and generous with their insights and, and lessons for us, and we really appreciate all of you preparing for us today. Thanks so much. Thank you. Fabulous job, you guys. Fabulous. 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 Fabulous.